if you look at our influencer culture, you know, you see all these people who are pretending that everything is perfect, when in fact they are insecure themselves and are suffering, and they know that they're an imposter. And of course, the uh, paradox of that is those watching these individuals buy into their narrative, and they look at their own lives, and they say, God, that person has it, and look at me, I'm nothing. And of course, that's a complete falsehood. We're excited today because with the science background of the show, I've not talked about manifestation. Oh, really? And I know with a lot of people, there's skepticism around it, myself a little included here. So I'm excited today to talk around the neuroscience and what mind magic is. So I think that might be a good place to jump in. What do you mean by mind magic? Well, I think um, what a lot of people don't realize is that they give their agency away. And what happens is so many people are looking for some sort of outside intervention that's going to make everything better or in some ways be magical and everything changes in their life. And in fact, as you know from the first line of the book, the universe doesn't give a fuck about yes, you. Exactly. <laughs> and because there are no fucks to give. And um, so part of the book is, one, so many people, especially young people, don't know the difference between what they think they want and what they need. And the other was what I was just mentioning is that so many people are waiting for something in the universe to either guide them or uh, give them what they think they want or need. And so um, both of those things uh, actually disempower you. So, um, one aspect of this is to make you learn the difference. And, you know, in Western capitalist society, the narrative is that if you make money, have uh, power, position, that suddenly you're going to be happy. And, of course, that's a false narrative. And as a result, people get those things and they're miserable. And I can tell you from my own experience Having, you know, gone to medical school, become a neurosurgeon, become a successful entrepreneur, you know, I would climb each of these mountains, if you will, and then I would get at the top and I would wait for magic to happen, and I'm now whole, I don't have any shame, <laughs> I'm not insecure, I'm not an imposter, and in fact, uh, nothing changed, and I still had that sense of uh, emptiness, and so... The question is, how do you fill that emptiness? And uh, this has sort of been my own personal journey. As you may know from my first book, I talk about my own personal background. And all of us, uh, who we are today is a manifestation to some extent of our past. And as a result, a lot of people don't appreciate actually the baggage that they carry which impacts relationships, decisions they make, uh, how they interact with others. And as a result, uh, that creates unhappiness because they don't understand that baggage is influencing every action they take. Exactly. And so one of the things, of course, is you have to become self-aware about that. And I think also, and this is one of the problems uh, about manifestation, uh, I'm sure you've probably heard of a book called The Secret. Yes. So, you know, The Secret has been extraordinarily successful. And uh, the problem in my mind with it is that it is a narrative about what I want. And this is where it goes off track. Okay. Because when you focus on what I want, in some ways, you're selling to people a narrative that when you get what I want, uh, everything will be fine and you'll be happy. And as I was just saying, the problem is that you get that and uh, you're still unhappy. Right. So part of the book is, one, reclaiming your self-agency, meaning you recognize the power you have within yourself— it's not coming from outside yourself. And that's the power, one, uh, to uh, choose if you're going to be happy. <laughs> and also 
recognizing that the way we evolved as a species, as you know, uh, unlike other uh, species, uh, our offspring need to be cared for, which means that uh, you have to respond to their pain, uh, and whether that's because of hunger or physical pain. And for our offspring, we have to take care of them for well over 10 years, if not longer. Well, what is the driver for you to care, uh, to expend the time and the resources? Well, the driver is that our evolutionary imperative uh, has actually created a system that rewards us when we care. And uh, while it involves a variety of neurotransmitters, the one probably the audience has heard about the most is oxytocin, sort of the love or bonding uh, hormone. So when you care, you get the release of this hormone, which then results in your uh, reward or pleasure centers being activated in your brain. But it does more than that. It's when you care, your physiology works at its best. And as you probably know, we have something called the vagus nerve, which is a nerve that is found throughout the body and arises in the brainstem, but it has two parts. And um, one part, of course, is the sympathetic nervous system, which is associated with the flight, fight, or freeze response. And it looks at the world through the lens of scarcity yeah. and fear. And then the other is the parasympathetic nervous system, which is called the rest or digest system. And when that's activated, uh, you feel open, you feel generous, uh, you're much more thoughtful, you're much more creative, you're much more productive. And again, uh, your reward centers are uh, stimulated and your physiology works its best. And that's in the context of cardiac function, peripheral vascular function, as well as your immune system, your levels of cortisol, your stress hormones are decreased. And so we are designed to care. So when we focus on us, it actually, of course, uh, in some ways is very much like the fear response. And as a result, you, you activate uh, uh, the various components of that through the vagus nerve, the sympathetic nervous system. While you can manifest, and the techniques that the Secret and some of these other books talk about are not necessarily wrong per se, although they're more efficient ways to get access to those centers in your brain that will increase the likelihood of you manifesting. Uh, but when you're focused on yourself, uh, that is not the best way to manifest, nor is it one that I think will help you in the long run. Well, one of the key points in the book, and we can delve a little bit more into your past, is this concept that when many of us manifest things, we, we manifest islands and cars and external events in our life happening to, in our mind, be that marker of success, status, that other people will respect us for. And you experience that. And as you said earlier, it didn't make you happy. So where do we think, where do you think most of us go wrong with that manifestation around those external things versus what should we be focusing on with our manifestation to actually be whole, to be living a rich and fulfilling life? Well, it's exactly what, uh, you know, I was alluding to earlier in the sense that we have been brainwashed by believing a narrative that success by Western capitalist definitions equals power, position, uh, wealth, uh, or things. Yeah, things. And, and then when you get those things, you're not happy. Or at least you're transiently happy, but it is not a deep... It's not lasting. ...lasting happiness. Conversely, when you do activities for others, that gives you meaning and purpose, which results in a depth of happiness, if you will, which is quite different, but in many ways is the one that will stay with you and actually define you as what you should be as a human being. Uh, and this is the difference between hedonic and eudaimonic happiness. Hedonic happiness is seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. And the neuroscience is quite clear. That's quite transitory. When you do the opposite, when you're of service to others, where you look at the world through the lens of being of service, two things happen. One is, obviously, you are... Uh, outside of yourself, 
you're benefiting others, which goes back to our evolution as a species. When we care for others, we physiologically and mentally benefit. But it also changes how you see the world because the things you think you want, such as wealth, position, and power, don't seem as important or you recognize are not important. You recognize them for what they are, uh, which is, yes, it can give you transient pleasure. But I believe what humans really seek is a deep uh, a seated type of pleasure and uh, one that is long-lasting, one that when you reflect on it, you have this warmth within, uh, within you and you feel good about yourself. And then you can see the results because of the impact you have on others. And I think that is a very, very powerful thing. And uh, as I was saying, when you are able to stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system, it has uh, magical powers. Not only does it make your physiology work the best, it actually increases your longevity. And why is that? If you look at the science associated with these areas called the blue zones, yeah. or uh, you look at the study that's been going on for 85 years at Harvard. The Harvard, I think it's called the Adult Development Study, but people happiness typically call it, it yeah. the Happiness Study. And this is uh, a now run by Robert Waldinger. But uh, what are the important lessons from that? Well, the important lessons are that when you actually think of others, act in regard to others, it has all the positive effects I was just mentioning to you. And the reason is it relates again to our evolution. We talk about the blue zones as these five areas in the world, but actually if you go back a few hundred years, that is how humans lived. They lived in community. You were born there, you died there, and everyone knew you. And the thing is that you we talked about imposter syndrome briefly. Everyone knew you, they knew the good and the bad, and they still loved you, and they were there for you, and they supported you, and they created a community where you felt supported. So you didn't have this voice inside of your head saying, I'm not good enough, I'm an imposter, people are going to find out about me. And, and so what happens is uh, you develop these deep relationships or connections to individuals, and that is sort of the superpower of our humanity. That makes everything work better. And that's why manifestation, when it relates to being of service, is also very, the most powerful way to manifest. Yeah, well, what I would love to unpack is what's going on with these neural networks. So I know we've talked a lot about the default mode network. You write in the book that there are other networks that we want to tap into to make manifestation as impactful as possible. So if you don't mind just walking our audience through the networks and what we can do to really have a stronger impact on what we are manifesting. Sure. When I talked about activating the parasympathetic nervous system and the physiologic benefit, which relates to these cognitive networks, part of it does uh, uh, in some ways relate to controlling your mind. And uh, one thing that's extremely popular is uh, mindfulness types of practices. But what this really tells you is that within each of us, we have this incredible power which so often we give to others outside of ourselves. And I'm sure you've lived through the experience of uh, you have this idea to do something or something you're just excited about, and then you share it with friends or relatives, and they go, you can't do that. That's impossible. And, and it's horrible, right? Because you're so excited and anxious, and these people tell you these things. And as a result, many people just give up because they believe it. And the mind doesn't know the difference between truth an untruth. And if you put in the narrative in your head that it is not possible, that becomes truth. Conversely, if you look at the through the lens of anything is possible, I'm responsible. Now, this isn't to say that, uh, you know, if you have these horrible external circumstances, magically they go away because you say, I'm empowered. But what it does do is it gives you a change in attitude, which actually changes your physiology. And this is why we see, as an example, you look at Wim Hof or some of these Tibetan monks who can control their body temperature or uh, their heart rate or other physiologic responses. Theoretically, these function independent of us. But what it shows you, you have the power within your mind to control these things. And you also have the power, and this is actually, I'm sure you've heard of Epictetus or some of the Stoic philosophers, 
external circumstances oftentimes you cannot control. Right. What you can control is how you respond. And in some ways, that's the nature of happiness too. You know, there are people who have very challenging circumstances and you meet them and they're joyful and happy. And you go, what? <laughs> how is that even possible? Right. Then you meet other people who have everything in the world and are absolutely miserable. Well, what's the difference? The difference is the choice inside their head. And so in terms of manifesting, there are multiple aspects of this. The first one is what so many people don't appreciate is we are battered by information from our sensory organs that are overwhelming. Now, 99.99% go to maintaining uh, homeostasis of our bodily functions. And this is about 10 million bits of information a second. But on a conscious level, we have control, if you want to use that term, of about 50 to 100 bits. So how do you take on a conscious level that information you want to embed in your subconscious to have it manifest. Now, what I would also say, there's a process called value tagging, and in some ways okay. that's exactly what we're talking about. We are creating something of value that is meaningful to us, and now how do we embed it? So there are these cognitive brain networks, and one uh, which was mentioned briefly is a default mode network. And this is when our mind wonders, it's self-referential, uh, and But also, you think about potential tasks or events you want, but the key is getting access to your salience network and your attention network. And what happens is, is that when you value tag something, you make it salient to you, okay? And once it becomes salient, your subconscious then acts as a bloodhound to be attuned to events in your surroundings that potentially can help you manifest. But it also, again, is very much related to the attention network because that's what gives the fine focus to things, okay? As an example, I'm sure you've been at a party or some event where there's a lot of noise, but if you hear your name, right. you suddenly Cuts turn. Above. Right, and why is that? Because on a, a deep level, your name or identity is always with you, and you're always attuned to that. And so this is the same with the power of manifestation. As an example, there's a project I'm working on, and I was at a coffee shop a few weeks ago, and it was very noisy. But suddenly, I heard these two individuals talking about the exact same thing that I was interested in. And, of course, I turned to that, and then I went over and introduced myself and connected with these individuals. But the point is that was embedded. So like a bloodhound, the uh, salience network was looking around saying, you know, how can we make this happen or I make this happen? And then once it reaches that level, then, of course, your executive control network, which is the to-do side of the house, if you will, and it gives you access to memory, prior experiences, et cetera, then that goes to work to actually have it manifest. So it's not to say having a selfish desire uh, gets blocked in all levels of manifestation. It's to say that the highest likelihood of you manifesting, though, if it is focused on the other. And the other good thing about that is, though, you realize oftentimes what you believe you want to happen isn't in your best interest, or you change how you look at the world when you're of service to others, and many times the things you thought you wanted are not what you actually need. Right. So default mode network is us starting to dream, visualize, think about things that are could be important to us, daydream. Sometimes it's, it's negative, sometimes it's positive. Once you value tag it, then you're now telling your subconscious mind, okay, let's look for this. This is now important to me. And then we can start to act on it. So it goes from daydream, thinking about what success looks like, to actually motivating our subconscious mind to move towards that success that we're looking for. No, that's exactly right. And how do you strengthen that? Well, uh, you strengthen this by uh, techniques which I outline in detail in the book. In fact, there's a six-week course at the end of yeah. the book. Uh, uh, but many of it is uh, familiar. Uh, you write it down because what you want to do is uh, – 
make it more and more impactful. Well, if you use all your sensory organs to do that, that's one of the things you do that. So write it down, uh, read it to yourself, read it aloud, and then relax and think about you being that or getting whatever that is. And each of those things strengthens this. And the more you do it, as you know, there's a saying that what fires together wires together, right? And so the more you strengthen that pathway, the more likely it is to be deeply embedded and the more likely it is that your salience network or that bloodhound will seek it out. And this is where this concept of synchronicity comes in. You know, you don't appreciate, well, like, well, that's amazing. I was just thinking about that. Well, it's because it's been tagged. And, you know, on some level, everyone is always manifesting or trying to. It's just like an athlete. If you've never done that before, it sort of works here and there, maybe, maybe not. (laughs) Right. And the more you practice, the more likelihood it is to happen. Okay, so let's let's walk through the steps because number one, I think, is really challenging for a lot of us right now in this hyper-distracted world of notifications dinging as we heard and everything else going on. We have to tap into our focus and actually start to move into, okay, well, what is it that I really want? So what are your suggestions for those of us who feel distracted, feel pulled in so many directions and, and maybe don't feel as focused as they need to be? Well, I think you probably described 99.9% of us. It is very hard. And as you well know, uh, the companies uh, that are doing this uh, mostly, uh, these social media outlets, actually they hire psychologists and neuroscientists to uh, create, if you want to call it, hits of dopamine right. to get your attention. And therefore, you become addicted to getting more and more hits of dopamine. Uh, so, of course, one is to uh, try to do a digital detox okay. or to limit the time you're on social media. Now, that is hard, uh, I think, for most of us. Uh, the other aspect of this is, in some way, self-compassion. Because uh, what happens is you are unaware of the fact that we beat ourselves up all the time. And oftentimes, we think that's just natural. And in fact, many of us are more critical of ourselves than anyone we know. And so one of the challenges is to uh, be kind to yourself. And I mentioned mindfulness practice. And while there are many different forms of mindfulness practice, one is being able to do a body survey, if you will, or uh, I call it relax the body. Because what people don't understand is when you're in the modern world, so many of us are uh, are stressed and anxious. And it gets back in some ways when I was talking about the blue zones or this uh, adult development study at Harvard. These people were not distracted. They didn't have to run to a job and be there exactly on time. They weren't criticized uh, if they didn't uh, were late or something or didn't have the impact. Uh, People communicated. And the other aspect that's really important is is being authentic. Uh, In the modern world, because you don't have family, siblings, or people you've known a long time around, people feel terrified of being judged by others. So if they're their authentic self, uh, they don't think people are gonna like them. And that creates another level of stress and anxiety. And so uh, one of the first things is to learn to be kind to yourself. At Stanford, where I run the center I founded called the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, of which His Holiness the Dalai Lama is the founding benefactor, we actually have very specific courses to teach self-compassion And the reason that's important, because we're talking about looking through the lens of compassion towards others, and let me just define compassion, it's the recognition of another's suffering with a motivational desire to alleviate that suffering. The problem is, if you're not kind to yourself, it's hard to look at the world other than being hypercritical. Right. And of course, your own hypercriticality uh, stimulates your sympathetic nervous system. And which is, of course, a detriment. Working against any yeah, manifestation. Yeah, manifesting things. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things is to learn to be kind to yourself. And uh, we can talk about my own childhood, how I uh, overcame that. And then, of course, then once you learn to be kind to yourself, you realize that everyone is suffering. And that just because somebody looks as though they have it together doesn't mean they do. 
Uh, and in fact, if you look at our influencer culture, you know, you see all these people who are pretending that everything is perfect. You know, their right. makeup's perfect. Or just a snapshot even. Right? Yeah, like, exactly. That's all it is. Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. And it's not a true snapshot in any right. way, shape, or form. The problem is, and I'm sure you've read about this often, is you, these people are trying to project a sense of perfection when in fact they are insecure themselves and are suffering and they can't reconcile these. So this creates despair, oftentimes hopelessness, and they know that they're an imposter, and in this case, a real imposter. And of course, that has a heavy psychological burden for these individuals. And of course, the uh, paradox of that is those watching these individuals buy into their narrative, and they look at their own lives, and they say, God, that person has it, and look at me, I'm right. nothing. And of course, that's a complete falsehood. And uh, the other thing that's important is to, when I talk about self-compassion, None of us are perfect. All of us are failed, flawed human beings. And in the face of that, the reality is we all deserve to be loved and cared for. Yes. And everyone. And so thinking that somebody is perfect or has their act together, it's just not uh, uh, true at all. And if you were to witness yourself, let's say, going through that exact moment, but as a child, you probably wouldn't be saying the things that your inner critic is saying to that childlike version of yourself. Of course not. No, I, I mean, you'd never say that. And this is the other thing that uh, is often overlooked as well, is that, you know, when you're a child, you are acutely sensitive to what others say, and words mean something. Absolutely. So if you have a parent or a loved one or somebody you respect tell you a negative thought, oftentimes that gets deeply embedded. And again, we're talking about childhood trauma. Uh, this is really a problem for a lot of people. I uh, was doing a program one time talking about this topic, and this woman uh, raised her hand, and she started crying. And she said, as a child, my father told me I would be nothing. And here she is in her 50s. She's a nurse. She has a PhD. She's uh, the CEO of a healthcare company, highly successful, yet she's still carrying that. Yes. Versus if her father had said, you know, you are amazing. I love you. You could do anything. anything. Completely different impact on her life because she's still suffering from what her father said. So honing focus, step one, what I found in working with our coaching clients, step two is often the hardest is defining what success actually is and really clearly defining what success is to you. And we talked a little bit about how as a society in Western culture, especially, we look to others to guide us to what success should be for us. And we follow what our families say or what school says or what influencers say as guides for what success is. And I'll often ask my clients, you know, what, what does it mean to be successful? What, what does success look like to you? And what I found is really fascinating is they'll, they'll often look to, okay, 12 months from now. They don't look far enough into the future and really paint that clear picture of what they truly want. Not just in the here and now or in a few months or 12 months, but five years, 10 years, what they want their legacy to look like is often very hard for us to define. So what is the advice you have for getting really clear on what success looks like? Because if we aren't clear, we can't tag it, we can't activate all these other networks to work to our advantage. No, you're absolutely right. You know, the challenge, though, is that uh, getting people out of the narrative they have in their head about what society thinks success is. And that's really hard for a lot of people because their whole lives, they've chased that. And when you sit there and say, is that really what you think success is? Many of them, to be honest with you, haven't slowed down enough to even consider it. To yeah. even consider it. And, uh, and they'll also give you exclu uh, excuses like, well, I'm just too busy. You know, work is so demanding. I don't have time to do it because, well, you know, there's this, uh, what was it, John F. Kitty said, if not now, when? When, <laughs> right. And uh, I think that's uh, really the key is you need to slow down. And uh, there are many practices to do that, as you know. Uh, one is a mind training practice. It could be mindfulness. Uh, the practice we teach is a little bit different, and I know John Kabat-Zinn very well, uh, who's a wonderful individual. But my statement to him when we've had discussions is uh, – Traditional mindfulness practice doesn't really explicitly talk about self-compassion or compassion for others. It's sort of in there, 
but it's not the main point. The reason I mention that is sometimes people use these practices, that type of a practice, to get more focus if you're a hedge fund manager. (laughs) And it's not to improve yourself and to be of service to others. It's how can I make more money by not being distracted by negative dialogue. That's not what the ideal practice should be. And so the practice we've developed very explicitly is to teach a body scanning or a relaxation practice, a focusing practice, but combine that very explicitly with self-compassion mm-hmm. and then follow that with compassion for others. And as I was saying earlier, until you can be kind to yourself, you look through the lens of hypercriticality. The other aspect is one of the ways mindfulness works is you learn to ignore the negative. But that doesn't necessarily down-modulate the negative. By actually having very specific positive affirmations to yourself, I am worthy, I deserve love, that starts changing the narrative and certainly decreases uh, volume of it. Yeah, the impact of the negative. Yeah, I I think it's, it's so fascinating how much of our own narrative around success is just tied to seeking love from others. It's like, if I get this, then my family will be happy. My friends will be proud. My neighbors will give me status. When in actuality, we haven't really gotten in touch with what we truly want to be successful. And it ends up chasing false gods and narratives that once you even reach them, and for a lot of our clients, they have reached those things, got the house, found the beautiful partner, and then they're still feeling this emptiness because that's not how they truly define success for themselves. No, I think that's uh, exactly right. And and this is the sad thing because people go through their lives and they're so focused on this goal. Uh, and this is fundamentally the problem with craving and attachment, right? That's what causes your unhappiness. And the extraordinary thing for so many people is they chase that absolutely focused on that, ignoring every other aspect of their life because they think if I have that, then all the other problems will be solved. And The reality, though, is there's nothing wrong with chasing a goal. It's, though, being so attached to the goal that when it doesn't happen, you feel destroyed. And the other reality is that the greatest part of that is actually the interaction on the journey with the people you're with and enjoying that and experiencing that because when you're present, which is what we're talking about, how do you become present? How are you able to attend? That's where our humanity blossoms when we're connected to others. And as we're talking about uh, the the, uh, uh, blue zones or this Harvard study, what is the fundamental aspects of those studies that tell us uh, about our true selves or how we should be? Every aspect of that points to the reality that depth of connection, depth of relationships are the most important thing related to physical health, mental Mental health, health, and longevity, period. And and this is why, you know, (laughs) you can look at Churchill and see this obese fellow who drinks three or four whiskeys and smokes cigars, and he lives to be a (laughs) hundred. Yeah, it's, well, the other thing that is so frustrating for us here at the Art of Charm is the amount of sacrificing of those relationships that we see in our clients who narrow their focus on that external goal, not recognizing that those relationships can actually even get you to that goal faster. No, absolutely. And in fact, I'm very much a believer in that. So many of my accomplishments are because of others helping me. It's not because I told everybody to fuck off and I said, I'm going for this, leave me alone. It's because I say, I need your help. Right, or Or, I'm working on this. Yes, yes, absolutely. And and it's so, so important. People get lost in in that. Yeah, well, step three, so moving beyond what defining success is, is obstacles. And one of the biggest obstacles is a negativity bias and looking at things and searching out, okay, well, what can go wrong? What are the worst possible cases? And of course, that robs us of the ability to, to see the success through. No, that's right. And what so many people don't recognize is we all have these different biases. And if you're not aware or don't seek out to understand some of these things, then you're always blind. And uh, so it's really important to understand, and we discuss many of these things in the book, is what are preventing or what are the obstacles or what are the causes that are limiting your beliefs. 
Yeah, I, I think one of the most fascinating parts for me in, in my experience is how relationships can often help you overcome those obstacles. And finding people who are zoomed out and looking at things bigger and allowing you to see an even bigger success for yourself than what you can naturally see just based on negative negativity bias or the way you were raised or some of the values and beliefs that you've adopted over time that hold you back from that greater success that you're actually uh possible to achieve. No, that's exactly right. I'll tell you a story from my own upbringing, uh, and this is in my first book, Into the Magic Shop, uh, Neurosurgeon's Quest to Discover the Mysteries of the Brain and the Secrets of the Heart. Uh, it's a long title. <laughs> I know. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I grew up in poverty. My father was an alcoholic, and my mother had had a stroke when I was a child, partially paralyzed, seizure disorder, chronically depressed, attempted suicide. We were on uh, public assistance. Uh, um, we were evicted from different residences. And of course, as you know, uh, uh, this idea of adverse childhood experiences, you know, the more of these things you have, the less likely you are able to be, quote unquote, successful by modern society terms. And in fact, many of these children uh, become drug or alcohol abusers or have mental illness. But what changed everything for me uh, was going into a magic shop uh, uh, and having a woman there who was not the owner but the owner's mother who knew nothing about magic. But she talked to me, and she was one of these individuals with this radiant smile and presence that embraced you. But the important part about it was she created an environment of psychological safety. Mm. She didn't look down on you. She didn't judge you. She listened to what you had to say. And after about 15 or 20 minutes, and you have to remember this was before mindfulness or neuroplasticity was even thought of, she said to me, she said, I'm here for another six weeks. If you come in every day, I'll teach you something that I think could really help you. And in the course of that interaction, she did teach me fundamentally a mindfulness practice, but it included a self-compassion practice, a compassion practice, and at the end of it, a visualization uh, practice, which ultimately is a manifestation practice. The problem with it was that I was 12, and she had, had me make a list of 10 things I wanted, which was a Rolex watch, a Porsche, a match, a, a million dollars. The point of that is you can get misguided, uh, and you, but you do have to take the time to have this internal examination. And you mentioned partners. People around you, in general, I would say, want to help you if you actually seek out and ask for help. Right. Uh, and that can be one of the greatest gifts uh, you can get. And it also strengthens the other aspect of this, which is uh, human connection. You know, going back to that earlier step, to step two around defining success, once you actually have a much clearer picture and you start to share it with others, then others can actually help you achieve that success. So much of what we, we talk about, we, we think about, we daydream about, and then we don't commit to paper, we don't commit to actual goals, and we don't then share with others who can actually help us leapfrog ahead in that journey. No, I think that's exactly right. And, uh, and one of the things you said I think is really important. This isn't, oh, okay, I wrote it down today and I'm done. It, this takes work. Yeah. Uh, even though I said the universe doesn't give a fuck about you, but it's true. I mean, you're only going to benefit if you treat it as if you're an athlete. You have to show up, you have to do it every day, and you have to mentally focus on that. And that's really the keys, uh, the keys to it. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a practice aspect in the book, and it gives you a step-by-step -step, uh, way to do so. And m much of it is a internal meditation type of practice. But a couple other things I want to emphasize, though, is, you know, for some people, when you mention meditation, especially high-powered people— <laughs> They'll go, you know, I can't do it. You know, I right. can't sit on that mat. I can't stop my mind. And uh, you have to separate that <laughs> right. from that. It's not the point. Yes. And uh, uh, sometimes, as Thich Nhat Hanh, as an example, talks about a walking meditation, being in nature. Basically, it's separating yourself from all the things that are so distracting to you. And certainly, being in nature brings us back to who we are in some ways as human beings. And it aligns us. Uh, the other thing I talk about, in there and you're talking about people wanting to help you, even though in the woo-woo pseudoscience world, people talk about vibration and all of these things, and it's not that what they're saying is 100% incorrect. They add baggage to it, which um, either can 
uh, not help you or is, in, in fact, a false narrative of what is actually going on. What I mean by that is, as an example, we talk about vibration. And there's no question that your brain vibrates or oscillates, and there are certain wavelengths you can train in your brain that actually maximize the positive effects you can have with that type of training. But the other thing is your heart has a certain amount of energy. And what's amazing is that you can actually measure your heart energy five or six feet away. And if you look at situations, as an example, if a, w a group of women become roommates, after several months, their periods sort of align, okay. right? And this is the true, this is true also when you have a presence that is positive, that you carry with you, you emanate that, that has an impact on others and actually can have a very positive influence on others. And the other example of this is to also look for people who give you positive feelings and not people who tear you down. Right. And, and this is another sad truth is there are people who will go out of their way to beat you up and make you believe yeah. this false narrative about who you are. And I can tell you, uh, I had, as obviously I explained, a challenging childhood. I wanted to be a doctor. Well, you know, I went to college and uh, it was really hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had to leave multiple times uh, to take care of, as an example, getting my father out of jail, uh, dealing with my mother who's in the hospital because she attempted suicide. And so, you know, I'm distracted, obviously. And so when I applied to medical school, my grade point average was 2.53. <laughs> <laughs> The average grade point average at that time for entrance at the medical school was 3.79. And um, at my college, we had a pre-med committee that you had to uh, request a letter of recommendation from. So I went to ask for this letter of recommendation, and um, the secretary uh, said, I'm not going to give you one. And I said, you know, I want an appointment to meet with these people. And she, I said, well, Why? And she looked at me and she said, because it's a waste of everyone's time. Wow. And <laughs> could you imagine? It's crushing. It, crushing. How somebody could say that to you and, and such a hurtful statement like you were nothing, you were a waste of people's time. time. So I looked at this woman. And again, this was the gift that this woman in the magic shop gave me, this unassailable confidence. <laughs> I looked at her and I said, well, I appreciate what you're saying, but I am not leaving here until you give me an appointment. Now, if you want to call security, that's fine, but I am not leaving. <laughs> so she did. Uh, now imagine, though, the next step of this, where I get this appointment, and I go into this office, and have you seen those photographs where it shows Putin at one end of the table, and there are these <laughs> yeah, guys? Yeah, this is massive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, this was like that. Okay. In the sense, there are three guy, people at the end of the table, actually a man and two women, professors, I'm at the other end. The guy in the middle who's in charge, he takes my file, he throws it on the table, and he says, he says, say what you want to say so we can get this over with. And again, <laughs> how can you do this <laughs> to somebody? <laughs> and again, fortunately, I looked at him and I said, I am not going to allow you to objectify me to a grade. I refuse to do that. I'm a human being. And then I lectured them for about 20 minutes. <laughs> okay. okay. And at the end of it, because I refused to let them do that, uh, uh, they ended up all crying at the end. Right? Uh, and because if you don't allow them to do that, if you stand up for yourself, if you believe in yourself, yeah. that changes everything. So they ended up giving me the highest letter of recommendation. Okay. And as I was leaving this uh, meeting, if you want to call it that, this makes me teary-eyed still yeah. <laughs> after all these years. <laughs> uh, that secretary, she was in the room, actually in the back, and she says, listen, um, I want to give you this. And it was an application to a summer enrichment program for socioeconomically disadvantaged students and minority students. And she, and she says to me, she says, but I want you to know uh, – the deadline has passed, but I don't think that'll stop you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, based on what I just saw. <laughs> so I ended up applying to that program and actually was accepted into that program. I applied to one medical school. 
which was where this program was, which was at Tulane University in New Orleans. So I applied to one medical school and got into one medical school. And I actually got in with that grade point average, and I didn't get a degree. <laughs> so, so, but I, the other aspect of this is no one has the right to tell you what you can and cannot do. Only you can do that. The other aspect is no one can predict another's ability. So if you fast forward after Hurricane Katrina— uh, the dean resigned, the dean of the medical school, and they were searching for another dean, and they had a fellow from Harvard uh, who uh, agreed to come, but he wanted an endowed chair, but they didn't have any money. Also, the library had been destroyed after Hurricane Katrina. So I ended up rebuilding the library and funding the dean's chair. So to date, the dean at Tulane is the Doty professor. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and so, again, no one has the right to tell you what's possible. And if you stay focused and you look at the world through the lens of being of service, of caring for others, and unleashing the power you have within yourself, because these negative thoughts create a prison brick by brick, and the walls get higher, they come at you, it gets darker. You are able to do anything you choose to do. You just have to believe. It has to start with you believing uh, in the power uh, within you. And then moving into setting that intention. So going from conscious to unconscious. And then as you learn that valuable lesson in the magic shock, being open to magic. Exactly. And that is uh, ultimately the key. Uh, so it is uh, defining your intention and uh, uh, having this unassailable belief within the power you have. Now, I don't want to give the impression that if you say, you know, I want to land on Mars in five years, <laughs> right? that is not going to happen probably. But the reality is, though, that you can change so many things about your world if you believe in the possibilities, if you change your beliefs from having them limited by your own self-statements, you can do so, so many other things. And while doing so, you improve the lives of other people and you improve your own life and you improve every aspect of your life. And ultimately, it leads to action, right? So a lot of what we talked about from, you know, default mode network to then working through what that success looks like, getting the intentions in place to move forward, are you acting on all of this? It's all great if it's upstairs in your mind, but all of those intentions have to be put into actions that move you closer and closer to what you ultimately want. Absolutely. But I would also say that sometimes people start these things and they have starts and stops and fits. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all of us do that. And I just had a conversation with B.J. Fogg who wrote Tiny Habits. Yeah. He's been on the show. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah, he's a wonderful uh, individual. And the thing is, though, don't try to do everything at once and yeah. start out uh, with small practices and and then build on those versus, and I've had a tendency to do this, say, you know, I'm going to lose weight and I'm going to I'm going to lose 100 pounds in three months. <laughs> yeah, sounds great. <laughs> yeah, it sounds great. And the first day or two, it works. Now, I will tell you, I said that one time and I actually did it, but it was the most unhealthy <laughs> thing. <laughs> but, but the reason I did it actually was, remember uh, Ted Kennedy, when he looked his worst, he was completely bloated and yeah. he couldn't get his, uh, sp so I actually was doing a, uh, a talk with Phil Zimbardo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I, I introduced him to videotape this <laughs> and I was watching the videotape and I looked like Ted Kennedy. <laughs> You saw the tape, and you're like, that's it. Yeah, yeah. So at that point, I said, I, I can't do this. So I, I did indeed lose 100 pounds in three months, but it was uh, brutal. I do not recommend that to anyone, and it's unhealthy. That's not in the book. <laughs> no, it's not in the book. But it tells you, you know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm also a human being, and uh, I don't make every right decision, and nor does anyone else. The other thing I would just also say is, you know, there are these two Japanese uh, – aesthetics, if you want to call them that. And I think that's important also for people to appreciate. One is wabi-sabi, which I'm sure you're probably familiar yeah. with, this idea of imperfection, uh, impermanence, and incompleteness. And this is the reality of our lives. The other is a related concept, which is kintsugi. 
And this is this uh, 16th century uh, narrative, if you will, about how pottery was rare and uh, would break sometimes, and it would be repaired with metal staples, which looked ugly, of course. But somebody changed that to using glue that had gold in it. And the reason that's important is because when it was repaired, you see the lines of the repair, but in some ways those are a gift because it shows what the pottery has been through. And the metaphor, of course, is that all of us have been through aspects that have hurt us, broken us, and those are not meant to be hidden. And this is the problem of being authentic is it's okay to show that you've been through this, but you've overcome it and you're still together. And I think understanding the importance of self-acceptance and not being ashamed of what you've been through or who you are is another very important component of manifesting as well because you have to align yourself. And I I hate to use the word energy because that's so woo-woo sometimes, (laughs) but you have to align yourself with who you are, what's important, what your goals are, And also be okay with yourself uh, because all of us are frail, fragile humans who make mistakes. And that's every one of us. There is no person who's perfect. Exactly. Well, what a beautiful point to end on. Thank you so much for stopping by. Where can our audience find out more about Mind Magic? Uh, Well, it is available for pre-order on any of the typical platforms for books. I won't say one because, but uh, independent bookstores. (laughs) (laughs) Please support them. Uh, So it's available there. I just actually did the Audible uh, for that, which was uh, a lot of fun. And also my other book, Into the Magic Shop, can be found at the same places. And for anyone who's interested, also uh, you can go to the Seacare website where there are all sorts of courses and programs uh, for compassion and self-compassion. And that's Seacare, C-C-A-R-E dot Stanford dot E-D-U. The other thing I would mention as another project I'm working on is called Happy, H-A-P-P-I dot A-I. And what that is uh, in some ways relates It's a platform that utilizes emotion assessment combined with a conversational AI knowledge base of compassion-focused therapy and uh, psychology connected to a human avatar. And you can actually interact with it. And the great thing about it is that, of course, it's an avatar, but it's nonjudgmental. It accepts you for who you are. And uh, it gives you a lot of interesting uh, supporting uh, uh, ideas, concepts to benefit you. And it's free to sign up and uh, you can try that out too. Yeah, that's beautiful. We've learned from a lot of our clients, they actually feel a lot safer with the anonymity of talking to GPT and sharing those deepest, darkest secrets than worth a human. Ours is a uh, self-contained platform that is strictly focused, so you can't head off into hallucination or, as some people try to do, flirt with or troll the avatar. (laughs) Or add 10 awards to your bio. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's okay. (laughs) Thank you again for stopping by. Thank you. I really appreciate it.